I'm Stephen Woods. I'll be presenting on a uh, service pattern uh, sale freighter. Uh, I'm going to make sure everyone knows right off the bat that I am not a naval architect. I'm barely a sailor. Uh, I am a historian. I have worked for 20 years in museums. Uh, I dished out of that field, uh, however, and uh, ended up working in the sustainability field. My master's is in sustainable and resilient communities. Uh, and I switched, made that switch because every time someone was saying like, oh, you know, how would we possibly solve this great sustainability crisis? I was physically holding the solution that had been used for several hundred years. Uh, so that's how I've come to uh, this field. And so this is based on uh, some things you might not normally hear from naval architecture. Some of this is based on the history of using uh, wind propulsion. And this is also based on uh, use for coastal trade. So this is gonna be short sea shipping and uh, as opposed to transatlantic type stuff. Now, let's start with some definitions. First thing we're talking about, this is an open source design proposal. Uh, there are good reasons to use that. Open source started as a software tool, uh, I was just mentioned. Uh, and it's essentially just publishing what you have so anyone can modify it and anyone can use it for free. There are other correlations to that. Uh, open source hardware, this is used for hardware, but also uh, for things that would be copyrighted, there are the Creative Commons licenses. Uh, and then, of course, you can declare something in the public domain. That would be the objective of this, because if you're going to get a sail freight uh, operation going, well, it turns out it's really helpful if you have some ship plans and you can propose what ship you're going to use. Now, I've said sail freight a couple of times. This is what I actually mean. For any terribly classically educated people in the, in the house that will understand the uh, trivium reference there, uh, sail freight is not just the same as just wind propulsion or wind-assisted propulsion. Uh, it is a type of wind shipping, but it is its own unique sector. It's normally in small vessels, normally using uh, traditional rigs. And on the technical side of things, it's all the way over at the, you know, maybe 10% using your motor, 10 to, 10 to 15%. Uh, it is designed not necessarily to optimize your ship, but to, for the absolute lowest carbon emissions per ton kilometer. Uh, there's more information on all that sort of thing in the Sail Freight Handbook, which is a uh, Creative Commons, uh, it's an open source publication from the Center for Post-Carbon Logistics. Uh, now, there is very good reason to, to create a open source Sail Freighter design. Uh, first off, there are vessels out there we could use. You know, there's, there are a couple. We could use regular fiber class recreational boats if we really wanted to. That's being done right now by Aegean Sail Cargo in the Aegean at very small amounts of cargo. Uh, but it's cheap, but you'd need billions of these things to move a decent amount of stuff. Uh, a lot of other sail freight projects are restored historic vessels. Uh, the Schooner Apollonia, the Gallon, Aventure, Tres Ombres, those are all old vessels that were refit for this use. There's only so many of them left. Even if we refit all of them, that's still not a lot of fleet tonnage. And then, of course, there's the new build sail freighters, things like Grand Sail, uh, TWOT, Seva. Uh, those are all being built, but those are a very capital intensive project. Uh, you know, those are specific designs meant for specific trades. Uh, it's a high capital requirement. You have to have the money to invest in that plan uh, in order to get anything going. Uh, a lot of these designs also, and we'll go over a couple in a few moments, uh, are not designed to maximize your fleet tonnage. When you're looking at sustainable shipping and you're looking at sustainable transportation as a whole, shipping is a part of, there are 27 years to decarbonize literally everything to zero or you cook the planet. That is a very short time limit. SAVE has been under construction since 2018. Still hasn't launched yet. It's not nearly fast enough. So if you're going to make these, they need to maximize the fleet tonnage you can build in a certain period of time. That means you need to set it around regulatory barriers. For these smaller vessels, that's license progressions. Your captain's licenses are at 25 tons, 50 tons, and 100 tons, gross register tons, because the U.S. hasn't caught up to the uh, uh, measurement treaties of 1960s. So that needs to be set so not only do you have a 25 gross register ton design so that you're getting the most out of that captain's license, 
but it also has to be stepped for upgrades so that a captain or crew who start on one of these smaller vessels can then eventually upgrade their license to move to a larger vessel as you increase the fleet of larger vessels. Um, and then the other big thing that hasn't been covered yet is that a lot of the designs were originally leisure vessels that were converted to cargo. These are very different vessel types, so they need to be uh, dealt with differently. Now, there are existing designs, as I said, quite a few of them. Uh, a lot of them fail to live up to exactly what I would uh, hope for, but have a lot of things worth taking. This is one of the electric clippers by Derek Ellard. He's an Australian uh, boatwright and ship designer. This one is uh, about 100 feet long, designed to take containerization and designed for use in the South Pacific. Uh, it's a good design, but because of measurement issues and a number of other things, it doesn't really fit the US uh, or coastal trade requirements terribly well for our environment. Uh, these are uh, schooner designs by Tad Roberts. They are essentially the same schooner in three different sizes. He's got a 28 gross register ton one. That's a problem because your licenses are 25, 50, and 100. So you have to have a 50 ton license to sail that one but you're only using something like 49 or 59% of the uh, actual license tonnage. And the next one down is 17. You need a 25 ton license to sail that. You're missing eight register tons that you could be putting to work. And it's below the 18 gross register ton threshold that would be needed for that captain and crew to upgrade their licenses to 50 ton. So a couple of drawbacks there, but that wouldn't be a huge project to uh, then redraw to fit those requirements. This is an, actually an open source design by uh, Jeff Utmark. Uh, he designed this in 2015 to work on the Erie Canal in Long Island Sound. Uh, it's a great design. I actually really like it, uh, but it's 80 feet. So it's under a whole different level of regulation and inspections and thus cost and licensing requirements because it's 80 feet, not 65. At 65 feet or below, it's under T-boat regulations, which simplifies your life quite a bit. Uh, another open source design is the uh, Greenheart vessel. This was designed again for the South Pacific, uh, small island states. I like it, it's pretty good, but it has a couple of drawbacks, I would say, uh, mostly in its rig. Uh, the rig uh, dedicates everything to one mast, which is, uh, well, from my military background as well, uh, we like things that don't have single points of failure. Uh, and it's also over complex. Uh, so that requires a whole new level of training for support for this design. This is another open source design. This one is uh, the series of the Vermont Sail Freight Project, built in 2013, sailed to New York City from uh, Virgins, Vermont, uh, I believe three times in total in 2013 and 14, and uh, worked quite well, can carry 10 tons of uh, cargo, uh, I would not trust this on open or rugged waters. Uh, it's literally a slightly pointy on the ends plywood box uh, with a yaw rig on it. So ideal for amateurs, which is exactly what that project was, uh, but it was successful. But you can't bring this, you know, around Cape Cod if you want to actually get there in one piece or uh, avoid, um, what's the term, uh, unscheduled submarine capabilities testing. Uh, there are other sources of design as well. Uh, oil prices have gone up before. During the last oil crisis, there were dozens of designs that were created and published. A lot of what we're doing today in this wind assist propulsion research, honestly, is just rehashing what happened 50 years ago, but with computers and better composites now. Uh, this design was set up for Tonga for inter-island trading. I'm not sure any of them were ever built. It is another good design. It was designed for crew efficiency, which is going to be critical in this because there's not a lot of training facilities for uh, wind propulsion. Uh, so that would be helpful. This could be retooled, but again, it does need to be retooled and there's not a lot of detail in the design. Uh, this was presented at the same conference in 1985 uh, in Manila. It was the original Indosail design. It's modular. This is a great thing to pirate if we're going to do anything open source. Uh, this is actually very similar to the Liberty ships in the Second World War, and that you just kind of stick in more or fewer uh, middle sections to get the tonnage that you want. Uh, that could be modified, of course. And uh, one of these in a three map configuration right there is being built right now for the Marshall Islands. So we'll see how that one performs. Now, again, we want to maximize fleet capacity. How do you do that? free plans, plans that people can take. And yeah, it's not gonna be completely free. We're going to put a lot of labor into this. 
it's still going to cost something to build the ship. But if you're trying to get investors for a project like this, and you have to start out spending 10 grand to get anything like plans to consider, that project now doesn't happen. So with freely available plans, now we have rapidly diffusible plans that can actually make a big difference. They need to be much like the Liberty ships, designed for simple and rapid construction. That's a design constraint here. Uh, because again, 27 years, that's it. Uh, as was mentioned with captain's licenses, every crew and every ship has to have the you know, maximum possible out of the crew uh, and the vessel itself. They should be able to start out really simple, like you know, not much better than camping aboard and then improve as you go, depending on the capital level available to the project. And the nice thing about open source is no one person has to do all of this work. If you like making sale plans, great, just do that part. If you like uh, you know, hull, optimize, hull optimization, just do that part. There's no you know, dedicating thousands of hours for one person or a very small team that's then not going to get paid. It can be a couple hours per person if you really wanted to. Uh, I'm gonna put the requirements up here on the screen. These are in the paper version as well. These are learned from specific experience with Schooner Apollonia, with other sail freighters that are active right now. Uh, it's also learning a lot from uh, the history of coastal sailing cargo. Uh, now, the tonnages are set up there uh, for a good reason. The rig variants are set there for a good reason as well. Schooners are highly crew efficient, and they're simple, and they're easy. Um, and this rig is well known. Uh, you can take someone who has experience on leisure sailboats, get them on one of these, and they won't be completely lost. And you don't need high capital or high tech stuff to trim those sails or anything. Uh, rope is a pretty old technology. Uh, it only dates back about 20,000 years. Uh, so, you know, pretty sure we'll uh, have people familiar with it. Uh, the other good thing about them. This is vessels under 1,000 tons. Uh, this was out of my master's thesis. Uh, tons per sailor compared to the ship's tonnage. Schooners are the orange line. So that's going to definitely be a rig we will want to be looking at because of the optimization of less available crew than we would like. The other vessel that we could really use would be something to use in canals. Uh, there are a group of us currently looking right now to expand Apollonia's operations into the New York State Canal System, Lake Champlain, a number of other places as well. It would be really great to have something that worked decently in a canal. Uh, the problem with canals is low bridges, and if you leave masts up when you try to go under a low bridge, it causes paperwork. Don't ask me how I know that. Um, now, same other basic requirements, uh, but this would really need electrification. And uh, I'm pirating the counterweighted mast uh, directly off of the Norfolk wherries that were used in England through from really the very early 18th century into the 1920s and 30s. Uh, it's a really neat design, actually. Uh, so here's the sail plan on one of them. Uh, but I'm going to move over here. The rig was actually designed with a counterweight. Otherwise, it's a cat rig. So if you're about to hit a bridge, you just undo the forestay, uh, drop the sail, and lean on the mast. And it folds down. And when you get clear of the bridge, you let go and then redo the force day and put sail back. Uh, so you can do wind propulsion in canals. It just takes a little bit more thought and uh, care. Uh, if you have a lot of bridges and you're not going to have much wind at all, just strip the rig off of it, cover it in solar panels, and you now have a self-sufficient electric canal barge. The other thing we're going to need, which has been stripped out from small vessels over the last 100 years, is infrastructure. Uh, luckily, that can just be a bunch of barges. Schooner Apollonia uses a large number of uh, different types of docking arrangements. A lot of them are commercial marinas. Those, by the way, can be kind of a pain in the neck because those docks are not designed to you know, stack cargo on. Uh, but a couple of the places they dock are just barges. So there's been a, a couple of sketches made up for essentially just a big old barge with some containers on it for warehousing. Warehousing will be important to this because you can't precisely schedule arriving with sail. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, so you need warehousing to cushion your, your earlier late arrival and other people's pickup. You just drop this wherever there's a convenient spot. You only need one ramp to land. And if you need more dock space and more depot space, 
tie a couple of these together. Uh, so that is a design project that should also be undertaken at some point, preferably for uh, the ability to build relatively locally. And that is essentially what I have. Those are the requirements that we're looking at, that we've learned from experience and from history we will need uh, for coastal trade. And the thing I would like to point out for coastal trade, which uh, was pointed out by uh, Marin as well, is that uh, a container ship, you know, that's what, 12 grams of CO2 per ton kilometer cargo-ish. The average for trucking in the U.S. is about 107. So if we're really going to decarbonize things, we're not selling marine transport. What we're selling is getting something from point A to point B. So if we want to reduce the carbon, what we really need to be doing is shifting things from rail and from trucks onto the water. And then we'll have a much better time decarbonizing from there. All right, questions? Uh, there's just one question online. All right, go for it. Uh, you're you're allowed to talk. Ping, if you'd like, you can unmute yourself. I guess all uh, questions announced. Uh, yes. In, in this banking, uh, still, are you still thinking that we still have some type of uh, mechanical cost rather than rent at all? Yes. Um, sale only has gotten very difficult uh, over the last hundred years, principally due to dock design. Nobody puts a dock where you can sail on and off anymore because why would you? You have a motor. Uh, and most sail freighters now are using, you know, have engines available, uh, and they're using them for a number of different you know, engine use strategies. The main one that's in use right now is just docking in emergencies. But it is really helpful when you're about to go on a lee shore to just go, well, that's going to be bad. Turn the key and motor off. <laughs> um, that's much better than the 17th century option of um, really, really hoping you can swim. Uh, as far as far as those rocks are, out, I'm sure. Yes. The open source kind of designs not really fast. Give an example of an open source engineering design that has worked before, maybe not necessarily in that art field, but in other fields. Um. Yeah. Uh. Series. Uh. I actually have the designs with me. If anybody wants to talk about them later, uh, I have the design for series with me. It was uh open source recently, and we know that made several trips. Uh, so that's a open source design that's been used uh, in uh, naval architecture field. Uh, for other open source stuff, uh, who has a Linux phone here? Or a uh, Android phone, rather? Yeah, that's off of Linux. That's, that's open source right there. Uh, open source hardware, uh, there's been a number of uh, successes, uh, most of which are you know dropping off the face, of, uh, dropping off my memory at the moment. Uh, there's a whole uh, system, though, at the moment. My brother's a farmer, so of course I would end up knowing this. Uh, there's a system, FarmHack. It's a website, farmhack.org, uh, and it's a whole bunch of open source designs for farm tools. And uh, those have been used extensively. I know at least six or eight farmers who are using them right now. Uh, a lot of it is relatively simple stuff, uh, but I will tell you when you are trying to uh, assist your brother with hacking through a quarter acre of pumpkins that took over a compost pile, it's real convenient to have those. Uh, another good one is uh, the Cargo Carla cargo bike uh, and trailer system. That all has also been open sourced and those are in use the world over. Uh, and they're quite common, they work quite well. Yes. Um, the idea on that is partly it's well understood, partly it's low capital. Um, you know, if you want to put on wind wings, that's that's a lot of capital that needs a lot of different skill. Uh, it needs a lot more software intensive, like strategic materials. Um, you could do a Marconi rig. 
that would be fine. Uh, that might give you a little bit better upwind performance. Uh, but the gaff rig in, uh, and any, any type of schooner rig or traditional rig has those advantages of well understood, low capital. Uh, and part of that, again, comes down to training. Um, when, when you look at, uh, when, I, when I wrote my master's thesis, it was on flying New York City by sail as an adaptation of climate change. Uh, and the very short version is we're going to need a lot of bigger boats. Um, but we're talking 65,000 sailors in less than 20 years, uh, just for the fleet to supply New York. That's not counting any other city in the U.S., assuming they get about 50% of their food by sale, which is reasonable in the New York metro area, food chain. That's a heck of a lot of people. Tall ships, you, tall ships America can't train that many people in the amount of time they have. But if you put all the U.S. sailing and ASA schools and leisure sailors together, then yes, you can train that many people to be that familiar with that type of thing. Anything else? Over there. Um, what kind of like cargo types would you consider the most useful for these like small, small and sailing cargo vessels? Would it be like uh smaller like luxury great bulk, um things that like can market uh, sustainability and navigation and like the fleet support? Uh yes, you're you're on the right track. Uh the main things uh, are uh palletized cargo. Containers are out the window, they're heavy, they're awkward, they're large. Um if you try to fit one container on a, on a 25 gross strikes per ton vessel, you pretty much run out of vessel. Uh, so it's going to be palletized and breakable. Right now, much of what is moving is things like wine, uh, chocolate, rum, uh, other high value goods. Schooner Apollonia is an exception to that. Uh, they move mostly malt. Uh, they move a large amount of hot sauce, frankly enough. Um, but uh, yeah, malt. Beer. Uh, they move a decent amount of, uh, in October, just haul a whole bunch of lumber strapped to the deck like it was sometime in 1860-something. Uh, that was an interesting experience tying that down. Um, so big bulk cargoes historically were the last thing that sail stopped moving. Uh, so that's uh, all going to be candidates. For this smaller scale vessel, though, initially it's going to be higher, higher value cargoes. It's going to be hard for people's marketing. Uh, but eventually, uh, anything that's not hazardous would be my reply. Uh, probably no just straight blocks of metallic sodium. That seems like a bad idea. All right. Anything else? We have a couple on lines. Okay. Uh, Dominique, if you'd like, you can unmute yourself. Dominique, did you have a question? Maybe we need to go through chat. I'm, 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 I'm suggested. <laughs> right, we, have, we have a couple of questions for chat as well. Uh, what do the economics look like for a 25 ton cross Long Island sound vessel? Uh, actually, reasonably good. Uh, there was one built in, uh, I believe it was 1971, that was in service for about five years. Uh, then the uh, price of oil jumped and they were in service a little bit more intensively for a couple of years. When the price of oil dropped, of course, they uh, switched to an educational mission and then they ran out of gas. Uh, the advantage we have here is that oil prices are probably not going to go down. Uh, and of course, there's another incentive. So for a short distance trade, that would be ideal, especially like across the sound, um, uh, that would work pretty decently. Uh, even in small vessels, uh, for example, in Ireland, where fuel was expensive, which is a good proxy for what we're about to run into, uh, and constraints with fossil fuels, the uh, Galway hookers, uh, which carried about 10 tons each, about 40 feet, uh, continued operations into the 1960s. So even something that small was viable that late in a developed country. Yes. Um... In regards to Long Island Sound, just if you like, even just sit and watch out from here, most of the stuff that's moved is, ironically enough, oil, which mm -hmm. obviously, eventually, one would like that to just not be the case. But yes, in the more immediate term, would a design like this have any capabilities in that regard? Uh, for oil? 
yeah, yeah you can build these as a tanker. Uh, it wouldn't necessarily be economic for very much for that. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, it's a relatively small amount, um, but you could if you wanted to. The thing to look at would probably be what you're going to be moving when fossil fuels are retired. Uh, yeah, you can electrify things, but we're still going to have a lot of equipment that runs on things like biodiesel, uh, biogas, things of that nature. Those will still need, need to be moved, and they'll be moved in smaller quantities because there will simply be less. So a couple of these as small tankers would probably make a decent amount of sense. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Great.